Welcome to the Blaze Sports Institute for Applied Science, CDSS Level 1 Curriculum. Today's topic is going to be injury prevention for athletes with physical disabilities. We do want to take a moment to thank Dr. Ben Johnson and Drs. Jackie McParlin for their contributions to the content of this presentation. Uh, today what we really want to do is just go over uh, some basic information, uh, so look at some sports science uh, uh, issues relative to athletes with disabilities and how those relate to injury prevention and preventing common overuse injuries uh, in specific disability groups. And we want to make sure that you understand both uh, injury prevention from both an acute and chronic standpoint. And hopefully what uh, that's going to lead to is your ability to reduce and uh, in many cases prevent common uh, injuries with your athletes with disabilities. Uh, here's uh, some of the objectives that uh, we want to accomplish today. And uh, if you attended the risk management session, uh, you're going to uh, have some redundancies in uh, what uh, uh, what uh, we covered there relative to a coach's role and an athletic trainer's role. Um, we wanna, we're want we going to talk about some stress and strain on the musculoskeletal system and how that leads to injury. Uh, we want to talk about the different components that make up fitness and how we can affect those through training and conditioning. And we want to look at um, specific aspects uh, in, within disability sport and adapted physical activity that could contribute to injuries. Now, sports medicine, what does this mean? It means that sports medicine team works together to improve and maintain a person's functional capacity to engage in sport and physical activity. Well, uh, that's great. And as you can see, it says that it's, it's multidisciplinary. Well, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. It means there's a sports medicine team with underneath an umbrella and there's two sides to the same coin there's performance enhancement and injury care and management and uh, pay attention to this because this is on the quiz uh, when you look at the performance enhancement side uh, you see the top three uh, uh, categories they're coaching well there's almost always a coach in any sport recreation program we do. Physical education, uh, obviously physical education happens in the schools. It also happens in the communities as well, although we don't typically call it physical education. Sports psychology, uh, very important in, in sport and even recreation and, and, and physical activity. It's often overlooked. Hopefully we stress the importance of sports psychology in the mental skills training session. Um, but uh, those, are, those are highlighted because those are probably the top three uh, on the performance enhancement side that people have access to. Not necessarily that people have access to a sports psychologist, but you do have access to sports psychology mental skills training principles. And then just to round it out, as you can see, uh, personal training, personal fitness training, strength and conditioning, sports nutrition, exercise physiology, biomechanics. We get over on the injury care and management side. That's when we get our, our health professionals and allied health fields, the athletic trainer, the sports physical therapist, the doctor, the physician's assistant, sports massage therapy, sports dentistry, osteopathic medicine, prosthetics and orthotics, and sports chiropractic. chiropractic. Um, these are all things that fall again they're all under one umbrella and the more of these people you have within your sports medicine team the better but you know often all you have is the coach so that's why we do this session to make sure that if you only do have a coach you don't have these other professionals you have some rudimentary knowledge of what role these other professionals actually have so the coach um, what does the coach uh, need to do well, you know, even if you have a certified athletic tra trainer available on a daily basis, the coach still needs to understand the, re the responsibilities of the athletic trainer in case that trainer is not there. The coach then must assume much of the responsibility for injury prevention. Additionally, the coach must understand the limits of their ability and, and the processes associated with return to play after an injury is sustained. One thing a coach should never do is provide care they are not trained to perform. Every coach should be certified CPR and first aid at a minimum and act within the limits of that knowledge. You know, just because you've seen 100 tracheotomies performed on TV doesn't mean you can do one, even if you did sleep at a Holiday Inn last night. Now, 
even if an athlete has medical clearance to participate in an activity, that doesn't mean that they're physically ready to withstand the demands of an intense practice or competition. Part of getting to know your athletes is understanding where they currently are in terms of strength, endurance, flexibility, aerobic capacity, and skill development. It's the job of the coach to ensure that every athlete meets a minimum level prior to full participation. They develop a plan to get that athlete to that minimum level. And continued professional development will help the coach ensure that they have the knowledge and skills to provide a safe and fun experience for each athlete. So what happens when there is no certified athletic trainer? Well, there, there are a lot of things to consider. You know, the, the coach then resumes many responsibilities. And again, as you can see the bullet points, you have to make sure that the competitive environment is as safe as possible. Um, you need to make sure that you're the one educating the parents about the risks. Assume proper, proper training and conditioning of the athletes. Monitor the environmental conditions. Select properly fitting and main equipment and maintain that equipment. Explain the importance of proper nutrition and, and hydration. And there are many additional field of play considerations when dealing with athletes with disabilities. What would you need to consider for an athlete with a visual impairment? An ambulatory athlete with cerebral palsy, an athlete using crutches or a walker, an athlete who uses a wheelchair. What are some of the environmental conditions you need to be concerned with? What are some equipment concerns that you need to be concerned with specific to disability sport? These are all things that get added in, and we address many of those things within the risk management session, so I won't address those here. One of the things I really want you to take away from this session is the relationship between fatigue and injury. And fatigue can result from improper conditioning, and it's one of the major causes of injury. Um, and again, when you think about training and conditioning, when you've got when muscular fitness and flexibility are not trained to the demands of the activity, muscles, tendons, ligament, ligaments, joints, and bone are subject to failure and injury. And a fatigued athlete is more prone to injury. When exertion levels exceed cardiorespiratory fitness levels, the athletes become fatigued and thus more prone to injury. So you want to make sure that you're monitoring your athletes. And as they do become more tired, they are more susceptible and prone to injury. So you want to make sure you're taking that into consideration during your training, during your practices, and during your competitions. Um, and you want to make sure that the athletes are engaging in a strength and conditioning program uh, as much as possible to help ensure that they do have proper levels of stamina when they engage in activity so that their, their chances of injury are decreased. One of the things we've talked about previously is uh, the myths associated with physical activity and people with disability. And one of those myths is that people with disability can't benefit from training. Well, they can. That is a myth. And one of the principles that, uh, that we look to is the said principle specific adaptations to impose demands. And then, you know, we've got one of the P90X uh, picture progressions there. Um, that person, obviously, uh, if that is indeed the same person, it looks like it is, um, engaged in a strength and conditioning program, and it was the P90X program. So he had imposed demands through that program and the work he was doing, stressing his cardiorespiratory system, stressing different muscle groups, and he also most likely engaged in a nutrition program, and these are the results. And essentially what the said principle is, is when you consist, when consistently subjected to stress and overloads of varying intensities, the body will gradually adapt and overcome the demands placed on it. Consistency is the one thing we need to be concerned with with disability sport, as we typically have only one or two practice sessions a week with our athletes. Now, this means that we need to do our best to ensure that our athletes are engaging in physical activity outside of our programs and doing so in a manner consistent with proper training principles. While this group hopefully would not be confused by the myth, there are people that think that people, again, people with physical activity, people do not respond to consistent physical activity as people without disability do. And again, we know that that's just a myth. And as we turn the page, we can see one, one nice uh, visual representation of how that's a myth in the bottom right there. So we have a, a, a bodybuilder who uses a wheelchair, and obviously uh, he benefited from his strength and conditioning program and has an amazing physique to show for it. Now, 
getting back to the topic at hand, training and conditioning, we want to talk about the different components of physical fitness. And in order to prevent injury, we need to make sure that the athletes and participants that we work with achieve appropriate levels of fitness in each of those categories, cardiorespiratory, muscular, and flexibility. Now, flexibility can be considered a part of muscular fitness, but because it is so important, I want us to examine it as a separate component. First, we're going to look at energy fitness, and it's particularly important in disability sport to understand the difference between aerobic and anaerobic energy systems and how to train them because all too often, athletes try to do everything. And track athletes that compete in the 100 meters through the 10K, particularly wheelchair track athletes and road racers specializing in the 10K marathon, um, you know, also want to many times participate in basketball. Well, the, tr the energy systems they have to engage in competing in a 10K or marathon are completely, well, they're not completely different, but there's not a whole lot of overlap between the energy systems they're going to utilize for basketball. Now, if you look at the graphic over on the right, we can see that a 10,000 meter run in 30 and 50K um, uh, cross-country ski marathon, so we, somewhere between a, a, a 10K run and a marathon, we are we are up in the 90 to 100 percent aerobic energy system in the zero to 10 percent anaerobic system but if we want to gauge in basketball we're halfway up that uh, that graphic there uh, along the same lines as an 800 meter swim soccer field hockey a 1500 meter run where it's about half aerobic half anaerobic so if someone wants to reach elite levels at both a marathon and wheelchair basketball chances are they may not be elite at either because it requires two completely different energy systems to be to excel excel in those two different activities and that's just something that we need to have we need to be cognizant of as we help our athletes select sports and give them realistic guidance as to what they expect can expect from their performance and their strength and conditioning programs now one thing of note, studies have shown that aerobic endurance training can have a negative effect on high strength, high power performance activities such as sprinting and powerlifting because this reduces muscle hypertrophy and anaer anaerobic energy production. So if you have a wheelchair racer that loves doing marathons, who wants to be a parent powerlifter, you may want to have a discussion with them about aerobic versus anaerobic fitness and their goals within Paralympic sport. Now the opposite does not necessarily seem to be true. Anaerobic training in the form of strength training, resistance training, can improve low intensity exercise endurance, increase aerobic power, and enhance recovery time for endurance athletes. Sticking with uh, cardiorespiratory fitness, one of the great things that we've learned over the last decade or so is the benefit of interval training. Uh, it used to be that uh, for swimmers, for runners, uh, for any of those, any of the sports that just in, in, involved repetitive physical activity, it was thought that the more the better. So if you're if you're an 800 meter runner, if you can go out and run 10 miles, and you run 10 miles every other day, and your off day is five miles, that's going to help you be an 800 meter runner. Uh, if you're a swimmer and you're specializing in the sprints, you know if you swim two miles a day, that's going to help you. Not necessarily the case. Now, with interval training, you might end up swimming two miles, but you're doing it in a completely different method. And interval training is a great way to train specific energy systems while at the same time maintaining a higher intensity for longer durations. If done properly, this can result in a safe training workout that produces optimal results without the danger associated with fatigue. Interval training is ideal for people engaged in activities such as football, basketball, soccer, and tennis. And if you go back to the energy sources scale, you can see these activities are loaded, located in the middle third of the continuum. And when you think about a disability sport program and the limited practice time you have with athletes, think about how utilizing an interval, tra interval training can be beneficial in that shorter period of time. Again, interval training allows you to do more work in less time. Flexibility, again, uh, flexibility is really a component of muscular fitness, but it is important, and we want to treat it separately. And a flexibility program should be designed to develop full, unrestric unrestricted range of motion around a given joint so that the movements utilized within the sport or activity can be accomplished without pain or increased injury potential. Now, flexibility has both a static and dynamic component, but should not be confused with static and dynamic stretches. 
Static flexibility refers to the passive range of motion about a joint, while dynamic flexibility refers to an active range of motion produced by muscular actions. And it's important to note that inflexibility, hyperflexibility, and an imbalance in flexibility can result in increased injury poten potential. Now, some of the things uh, that affect flexibility, um, you know, an your anatomical um, considerations, joint structure, age, gender. Young people tend to be more flexible than old. Females tend to be more flexible than males. There's not a whole lot that you can change about uh, the anatomical effects to flexibility. Training effects, however, uh, can change your levels of flexibility. How active are you? Are you engaging in resistance training and stretching exercises? Increased activity levels combined with proper resistance training and stretching can maximize your range of motion. And again, as long as you don't maximize that range of motion and go into hyperflexibility, uh, you're, you're, you're decreasing your injury potential. Now, I will say this, and this is important to note, study after study after study has shown, has, has shown that there is no, no, there is no correlation between stretching and, and injury prevention. You know, it's just not there. Um, and we'll get into warm-ups in a moment. You know, a proper warm-up, getting the muscles loose, getting the, the blood flowing, um, getting the contractions going with sports-specific movements uh, prior to a competition, prior to training, uh, is more beneficial than actually stretching. Now, that doesn't mean that stretching and flexibility aren't important. It is important to have proper range of motion for the activity and you get that through proper stretching and a flexibility stretching and flexibility program. But prior to competition, overstretching can studies have shown stretching can lead to performance deficits. So it, it does get a little bit confusing. There is no scientific correlation between stretching and injury prevention. There is a scientific correlation between stretching and decrease in performance. But that doesn't mean that stretching and flexibility isn't important. You still need to have proper range of motion for the activity at hand. And that just doesn't happen. That happens through a stretching program to produce that proper flexibility. Our slide seems to be a little uh, um, disfigured here. So there should be uh, loading or force should be down there just to the left of the deformation where uh, you have the different types of loading or force, a tension force, a compression force, a shear force, a bending force, and a torsion force. So tension is kind of if you took a rubber band and you're pulling at it, that's creating tension. Compression, take a spring, push it together, that's a compression force. A shear force uh, would be kind of like a, um, a shearing a piece of metal. You know, if you've got a big old, if you're familiar with metal fabrication, a shear would come down to cut a piece of metal in half. That would be a shearing force. Bending, of course, I think everybody's familiar with the bending force. And then a torsion force is a spiral force about a joint or a bone or soft tissue. Types of deformation that you can have, uh, you can change uh, its shape and length. Uh, you can uh, you can stretch. You can test the elastic limits of your bone, obviously, through the different loadings or forces, your tendons, your ligaments, your cartilage. And what happens is as you go through this, if you do this to an extreme, you could reach the failure point of that tissue. And we're going to look at a graphic next. And as we look at this, uh, we've got the, the, the length of the deformation of the tissue along the x-axis and the force of load on the y-axis. And as we increase and we just follow that at a perfect 45-degree angle, uh, we've got that elastic region. Uh, for the soft tissue, and the elastic region is where the soft tissue will expand, will expand and contract back to its normal, normal shape and length. But as we increase those loads, as we lengthen that tissue, we increase the ability of or the potential for that soft tissue to start to experience micro injuries, and that can just be small little tears in the tissue. What happens is you keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that, those small tears add up. And as you extend and get outside the plastic region, the plastic region is the maximum uh, length that the tissue can be stretched. 
until it reaches complete failure. So there's two ways to reach complete failure. You can extend the tissue past its plastic region and it'll just fail, or through chronic um, through chronic activity, through chronic micro-injury, those micro-injuries can build up and you can have a complete failure of tissue as well. Uh, we talked about range of motion, static range of motion, and dynamic range of motion. There's also uh, uh, static and dynamic or passive and active stretching techniques, and we're going we're gonna to talk about those now. And, and once again, I just, wanna, just want to uh, reiterate that the research shows there's no relationship between pre- and post-participation stretching and injury prevention or subsequent muscle soreness. But again, that doesn't mean that stretching isn't isn't beneficial. You do need to have proper range of motion uh, about your joints for the activity at hand. And if you don't have that, that's when, if you don't have that proper range of motion, that's when, if we go back a, sli back a couple slides, oops, we'll go up here. If we go back a couple slides, if you, if you look at this, um, if you look at this, if, if your elastic region, if your sport demands that your range of motion actually come out to here, and this is your elastic region, this is your range of motion, and you're not, you're not increasing your flexibility, and you're constantly coming out to here, constantly coming out to here, constantly coming out to here, this is where the micro-injury occurs, and eventually you're going to have complete failure of the tissue. Whereas if your sport, if, 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 uh, your sport requires that your tissue be expanded out to here, and you engage in a proper flexibility program, and you increase your elastic region, out to there, you're going to have less potential for injury because you're within your normal range of motion. You need your normal range of motion. You need the sports activities, the range of motion for your sport to be within your normal range of motion in order to prevent injury. Now, again, let's talk about uh, the passive stretch, stretching techniques, also called static stretching. These are excellent for increasing range of motion. It's appropriate for all athletes who need to increase flexibility. It's the safe and safest method of stretching because it engages slow, controlled movements. And it moves the muscle to a position of mild discomfort. Generally, you want to hold that for 30 seconds. You want to do that for three repetitions. And, again, this is great post-exercise, post-competition uh, technique to realign those muscle fibers, uh, aid in the cool down, and, and, and help you get ready for the recovery phase. When we look at the active stretching, uh, and there is a difference between ballistic and dynamic stretching. Ballistic stretching is bouncing type movements. It's a stretch that's not held. It invokes the stretch reflex. There's a higher, higher potential for injury just engaging in the stretching technique. It is not recommended for increasing flexibility. And the injury potential associated with ballistic stretching should not be confused with plyometric training. Plyometric exercises should be performed within the existing range of motion. Ballistic stretching engages motions and activities that take you outside that normal range of motion. And they really aren't, they aren't recommended for the novice athlete. You do see lead athletes engaging in ballistic stretching. If you see sprinters before the 100 meters that are bouncing up and down, that's some ballistic stretching. Swimmers, Michael Phelps is a good one, flapping the arms open and closed, wrapping them around his body at a high speed. Um, that is a ballistic type of stretch. So it has a place, but it really should be utilized for highly trained athletes. Now, different from ballistic stretching is dynamic stretching. And sometimes dynamic stretching is confused with ballistic stretching, but they are different animals. Uh, dynamic stretching utilizes functional, sport-specific movements without bouncing. It is an ideal stretching technique for use during warm-ups as it incorporates multiple joints, it helps maintain your body temp, and it's time efficient. It's not as effective for range of motion increases as static or PNF stretching, uh, but it is, again, a useful technique. Now, PNF stretching, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Now, this was first used in neuromuscular rehabilitation to assist patients with increased muscle tone and or activity to increase their range of motion. Now, uh, when we think of... Uh, you know what when we think of disability groups what disability group falls within that genre well people with cerebral palsy brain injury stroke okay and what PNF does it has the ability to produce dramatic increases in range of motion in a single session and when used consistently over an extended period it can produce greater effects than static stretching 
Now, PNF typically requires a partner, and there are three basic types of PNF stretching. There's the hold relax, the contract relax, and the hold relax with agonist contraction. Um, and I'm not going to go into those. You can look those up. Uh, there's a ton of resources online. Uh, but uh, PNF stretching is actually something that I uh, utilize with my hamstrings after I work out. Uh, it's some, that is one, one muscle group that you can do by yourself if you've got a towel and have a little bit of flexibility to begin with. I highly recommend it. Uh, but again, you do need to know what you're doing. It typically does require a partner, and that's not something you want to try to engage in if you're not trained in it. Now again, static stretching, um, again, excellent for increasing um, uh, range of motion. It's the most common method, uh, again, appropriate for all athletes. And if you want to utilize static stretching techniques, uh, you want to employ a 30-second hold and do that for three to four repetitions. Uh, the ballistic stretching, again, bouncing movements. It's not held. It invokes the stretch reflex because it goes beyond your normal range of motion. It's not recommended for increasing flexibility. It does have a higher potential for injury, and, but it is not the same as plyometric training. You know, ply, and the biggest difference between ballistic stretching and plyometric training is plyometric training is performed within an existing range of motion. Uh, dynamic stretching, again, functional sports-specific movements. Well, what, what does that really mean? Um, that means, you know, again, I'll go back to wheelchair basketball. A simple layup drill can incorporate dynamic stretching. And what you just want to do is exaggerate those movements a little bit. Exaggerate that push. Maybe come back a little bit when you're loading up to push the wheelchair. Follow through a little bit further. Lean back a little bit further when you're getting ready to shoot the ball. Follow through with a little bit of over-exaggeration. You're, you're warming up your muscles and your joints, utilizing sport-specific movements within your range of motion. You're making sure you have that proper range of motion, and you're getting ready to play the game. Um, but again, not as effective for range of motion to increase as static or PNF stress. And again, we went through the... Uh, we went through the PNF stretching, and again, I would highly encourage you, to, if you're not familiar with PNF stretching, to look up uh, look up PNF stretching in those three types and get a little bit more feel for what that is all about because it is a useful technique. Muscular fitness. So we've talked about cardiorespiratory fitness. We've talked about flexibility now, pure muscular fitness. And what is muscular fitness? Well, it's the ability of muscles to meet the demands of sport with optimal strength, endurance, velocity, power, and flexibility. Now, each sport or activity requires a different mix of components. Sprinters require more power and less endurance. Basketball players need a good mix of strength, endurance, power, and gym gymnasts need excellent flexibility and power. So there's something different for everyone. Now, when we talk about muscular fitness, um, as you get stronger, as you get more powerful, there's an increased uh, potential for injury. And here's a simple graphic of what that looks like. You know, muscles produce force. Force leads to motion. Motion produces energy. And the more energy you have, the higher the injury potential is. And muscles are the only parts of the body capable of producing force. Okay? Very important. Bones cannot produce force. Um, ligaments cannot produce force. Tendons cannot produce force. Only muscles produce force because muscles are what can contract. Muscles move everything. I'm going to get into a little bit of physics here. And when we talk about strength, uh, one definition of strength, the maximal force a muscle group can generate at a specified velocity. Well, you know, why is velocity important? Well, almost all sport has a requirement for velocity. Uh, which we could also call speed, and changes, and changes in velocity, which is also known as acceleration. So typical measurements of strength utilize measures of isometric force or force applied at very low constant velocity, but that's not very useful in determining functional strength or power in sport. As a result, strength nowadays can be measured by the maximal force a muscle group can generate as specified velocity. 
Now, while this can be a much better predictor of sport performance ability, the measurement devices are typically not available to the disability sport program. They're expensive, um, they're high end, but nevertheless, it's important to understand the relationship between strength, velocity, acceleration, and power in sport. Now, and here's a, just a little example of that if two sprinters with the exact same stride length can produce the exact same force with each stride, but one sprinter can produce the force more quickly, who wins the race? Well, obviously, the sprinter that can produce the force more quickly is going to win the race because he's going to get more strides in in a shorter period of time. And if the stride lengths are the same, he's going to cover more ground in less period of time. Again, a little bit of physics. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. And that is Newton's second law. And acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. Well, you know, why is this important? You know, well, we're going to see on this next slide, force equals mass times acceleration. Acceleration is the change in velocity over time. And here's what I want you to get from this. As you look down the left column, if we want to increase force, uh, that means we can either increase mass, we can, have, we can have a greater change in velocity or higher end velocity or decrease the time with which it takes to make that change in velocity. If we want to decrease force, we can lower mass, we can have a lower change in velocity, or we can take more time to do that in. Now, what, what does that mean? How does that relate to injury prevention? Well, when you th talk about mass, okay, Mass in sport, do we really have the ability to change mass? I mean, the athlete is the athlete. The equipment they're using is the equipment they're using. There's really not much variation day-to-day -day in mass. So mass pretty much remain, remains constant. Um, when we talk about changes in velocity, of course we can change velocity. Um, that's part of sport is how, how quickly and how well we can change velocity when our maximum velocity is. But how does this relate to injury potential? And the one thing I want to relate this to you, to you, uh, it has to do with safety equipment and why we wear safety equipment, um, but also some of the decisions that we can make in in, in sport, in physical activity. Um, when you look at the formula, if mass is constant, and we say that uh, an athlete's velocity is an athlete's velocity, so if mass is constant and velocity is constant, and we have an athlete that's moving at a given speed. And let's take, uh, let's take a wheelchair racer, for example. Uh, wheelchair racers can, on the road, can get up to 30 miles per hour. Now, it is highly recommended that all wheelchair racers wear helmets, and essentially they're wearing cycling helmets. So an athlete's mass is an athlete's mass. Obviously, if you're competing in a marathon, your mass might change a little bit as you lose water weight. Um, but your, your objective is to reach your maximum velocity. So your top speed is your top speed. How does this relate to injury? Okay, think of a crash. Okay. In order to prevent injury, lower the injury potential, you want the resultant forces in that crash to be as low as possible. And for this particular instance, let's think about the head, the head in a helmet. So you want the higher the force, the resultant forces in that crash, the higher likelihood there's going to be a head injury. So we want that force to go down. However, your objective is to reach a maximum velocity. So that's that's set. Your mass is set. So the only the only variable we have left is time. We want to we want to increase to decrease the force. We want to increase the amount of time it takes to go from that maximum velocity to zero, and that's where protective equipment comes in and why it's padded, because that padding, however minute it is, increases the amount of time it takes from the time your helmet hits the road to the time your head actually stops moving. It increases that time and thereby decreases that force. Now, that's also the reason why we are in crashing situations that we try to break our fall. We catch ourselves and we try to cushion that. We use our arms and legs as shock absorbers. When we jump up in the air, we don't want to land with our knees locked. We land with our knees bent 
because we utilize that, we increase the amount of time it takes to go from that velocity to zero. That's, that's the relationship from a standpoint of physics, force equals mass times acceleration uh, to injury prevention. Now we talked about power, muscular power, and uh, power movements. And here we see the relationship between power, work, and time. And essentially, we'll generate more power as we can produce the work over a shorter period of time. Well, you know, why is this important? Well, to be successful in sport, a lot of times requires power movements. But we just saw, uh, we just saw that in order to prevent injury, we want to increase the amount of time it takes to change uh, to change velocities. But if we want to increase our work, or we want to increase our power, we want to decrease that time. Okay. So again, it's just a matter of being cognizant of the relationship between the laws of physics and injury prevention. As we train and try to get more powerful, one of the one of the ways we get more powerful is producing the same amount of work rapidly over a shorter period of time. But as we do that same amount of work over a shorter period of time, our injury potential increases. So that is one of the reasons why we want to make sure that we're always teaching proper techniques, because as our athletes get more and more skilled and they grow stronger and more powerful, the injury potential increases. So it's even more imperative that they're executing the skills with proper techniques so as to decrease that injury potential because they're increasing it on one side as they do get more, uh, as they do grow and get more powerful. Muscular endurance. Endurance is the final component of muscular fitness. And again, fatigue facilitates injury and athletes need to be properly conditioned to perform their sport. Now, you can have great strength and power, but if your endurance isn't up to par, it can all be for naught, depending on the sport you're participating in. And now this should serve as a reminder as to why it's so important to develop all the components of physical fitness. As we strive to develop stronger, more powerful athletes, we're at the same time introducing greater and greater potential for injury. By ensuring that our athletes and participants have proper cardiorespiratory, flexibility, and muscular fitness, so as to engage in the activities associated with the task we ask them to, we're ensuring that we're reducing fitness-related injury potential to the greatest extent possible. But there's one more area that we need to be concerned with, and that's muscle balance. Now, this is true for almost any athlete, but particularly true for the athlete who utilizes a wheelchair either for their sport or for their sport and for daily mobility. And shoulder muscle imbalance is a serious concern of those athletes. Um, and not only are the shoulders overused from an anatomical standpoint from the activities of daily living that promote a natural muscle imbalance in the shoulder joint where the posterior muscles remain underdeveloped relative to the anterior muscles, but people who utilize wheelchairs for daily mobility need to engage in a strength and conditioning program that develops the strength and flexibility of the posterior muscles and promotes rotator cuff health. Those who also participate in sport and physical activity activity are even more at risk of shoulder imbalance and in need of a proper strength and conditioning program. And when a shoulder, when a, excuse me, when a muscle imbalance occurs in any joint, occurs in any joint, injury potential is greatly increased as tightness and or inflammation can lead to reductions in joint space, increased contact between articulating surfaces, and create a downward spiral towards injury. And just to show you uh, a couple differences here, uh, here's a knee joint. And here you can see the difference in the joint space between a healthy, flexible, muscle balanced knee on the left and a knee that has flexibility deficits and muscle balance issues on the right. And here you might want to make sure the hamstrings and quadriceps are balanced in terms of strength and flexibility. Now, with this knowledge, how what would you need to, you know, with this knowledge, what do we need to develop fitness in those three areas? And how do we go about creating a program that addresses that development? Food for thought. Principles of conditioning. Uh, to begin, in order to ensure proper cardiorespiratory, flexible, and muscular fitness, we need to adhere to the principles of conditioning. And the first is warm-up, cool-down. 
And this is one area that tends to be neglected in disability sport due to the limited amount of time that we have with the athletes or participants. It's the first line of defense in preventing injury during a practice, training, or competition or activity. Even the most well-conditioned athlete can sustain an injury if they have not properly engaged in a warm-up. Now, stretching should be an integral component of both a warm-up and a cool-down, and we've already discussed flexibility and stretching techniques. Here what I would like to emphasize that for disability sport, it's very important to give your athletes the knowledge and skills to engage in a flexibility program at home and or during other activities. Flexibility training as a separate session could easily incorporate static stretching to improve flexibility or PNF stretching if a knowledgeable partner is available. But stretching during warm-up should utilize dynamic stretches. Uh, in general, this is going to be low-intensity, sport-specific actions used to increase the heart rate, blood flow, body temperature, respiration rate, and perspiration, and decrease joint viscosity. This should be made an integral part of the warm-up process, and it should be specific. You should utilize sport-specific skills with increasing intensity as you're going through the warm-up. Now, the cool-down has uh, many benefits. Obviously, we want to bring the heart rate back to baseline. We want to make sure we prevent blood pooling in the lower extremities. Obviously, something very important for athletes who may not have use of their lower extremities. And again, in the cool-down, this is where static stretching can really help relax the muscles, maintain that range of motion, realign the muscle fibers, and aid in the recovery process. When we talk about principles of conditioning, uh, one of the areas is motivation. Now, how do we keep someone motivated? Well, you know, yes, you can vary the training program, keep it fresh, you can utilize proper goal setting, but those all need to be done in an effort to make it fun. You know, if, if people aren't enjoying the activity, they're not going to stay motivated, and they're not going to adhere to their strength and conditioning program. Another principle, overload. Uh, if you're trying to increase strength, increase speed, increase endurance, increase agility, that means you have to push yourself past where you currently are. If you just keep doing the same things within your current capabilities, you're not going to get any better. If, uh, if you're capable of running an eight-minute mile and all you ever do is go out and run eight-minute miles or you do interval training and you never exceed an eight-minute eight mile pace, you're probably not going to ever run anything faster than an eight-minute mile. You have to make sure that you gradually tax yourself and overload yourself. Consistency is key. In order, in order to realize change, you have to engage in a program at least twice a week. Uh, three times is the minimum recommended. There has been, have been some studies that have shown uh, uh, lasting increases in performance with a two-time-a-week program, but three is really what you want to need to hit. Uh, progressions gradually want to increase the intensity of that program. Uh, the intensity, increase the intensity rather than quantity duration. That's where interval training comes in. Rather than, uh, rather than running uh, 10 miles a day, you can run five miles at intervals where you increase the intensity for certain periods of time. So you have rest intervals that allow you to rest, recuperate, and then you can pick up your pace. You want to make sure that you're addressing those specific areas that you want to increase. In other words, you don't want to develop your anaerobic fitness if you're an endurance athlete. You don't want to uh, overdevelop your aerobic fitness if you're a pure power athlete, a sprinter, or uh, a weightlifter. And again, individuality. Adjust the training program to meet the needs and the progression of the individual athlete. And also make sure it keeps that individual athlete engaged through enjoyment of the activity. One of the things that we that we can't overlook is stress. And this is not necessarily stress uh, within, within the training environment, but it's stress outside the training environment. Stress has shown that life or stress research has shown that life stressors have re a relationship to injury. You need to know your athletes and know if they have personal issues going on that may require some time away from training so they can resume participation without increase for potential. In other words, research has shown people that have a lot of stress in their life, uh, in their personal life, are more prone to injury in their athletic life.
and it may be better for them to actually take a break from training and competition, get their personal life straight, and then come back in order to maintain proper health. And safety, uh, we've been over this uh, multiple times, but make sure the training environment is safe and that you educate the athletes to be aware of what they should be feeling during a training session and know when to back off and when to push harder. Pain means something is wrong and training should, should cease. Extreme fatigue subjects the athlete to injury and should be avoided. One of the concepts you can utilize within uh, strength and conditioning is periodization. And periodization is very important for serious athletes, especially those that participate in most, multiple sports. Periodization is the concept where the training and conditioning program is broken down into cycles. And cycles can be any period of time. It can be a year for seasonal sports. It can be four years in the case of a Paralympic athlete. But essentially, it breaks the training cycle down into three components, preseason, in-season, and off-season. And what happens is the intensity, volume, and specificity are altered throughout the cycles to produce peak performance at the right time during that competition period. And here we see a, a nice chart of a breakdown of what can happen, what happens in each, each of the seasons, the period of phase within that season, the type of training that occurs. In the off-season, which uh, obviously we think of the off-season as beginning right after the season ends. So hopefully uh, your periodization uh, plan has you peaking right at the end of the in-season schedule. So as you go into the off-season, uh, you've just you just peaked and now it's time to rest. So you enter that transition period and you just want unstructured. You don't want to go to practices. You want to engage in some fun activities. You want to stay active, but uh, you might want to play a different sport. You might want to just do some things for fun that keep you active. As you engage in that and allow your body a chance to heal, allow your mind a chance uh, to uh, rejuvenate, regenerate. You're going to get into the preparatory period. Now is when you start engaging in some more structured activities, still doing some cross training, not just doing your sport specific training. But in the first part of the preparatory phase is when you can look into building your muscle mass and your endurance. You're going to have low intensity, high volume general resistance training activities. Uh, then you can move into your strength phase. Now we get into a little bit more moderate intensity, the volume comes up and you begin your sport specific skill training again. And then as we move to the end of the off season, get into that preseason, we want to increase that power again. And we're going to jack that intensity up. Uh, we're going to decrease the volume actually, but now everything is going to be sport specific. We want everything being functional and sport specific. And then as we move into the season, we're into our competition period. Again, we keep that intensity high. We keep the volume very low. We're engaging in skill training, strategy sessions. We're, we're, we're engaging the mind as well as the body. And we want to make sure that we're maintaining the strength and power gains that we, that we experienced during the offseason and the preseason. Some of the age considerations you want to take into account um, when you're dealing with youth, you want to make sure that they have the emotional and cognitive and maturity to, unfollow, to follow directions. Uh, with the youth, you want to focus on muscular strength, endurance, flexibility, and cardiovascular endurance. Power is not on there, okay? Uh, and what that means is you're not putting them under extremely heavy loads. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can't develop strength, but you're going to do that through moderate loads and high repetitions instead of heavy loads and low repetitions. Older adults, make sure you know what their pre-existing health conditions are. Um, make sure you incorporate aerobic and resistance training. That's going to help keep their bone strength up. That's going to help keep their muscle tone. It's going to keep their metabolisms high. Uh, obviously, you want to begin with low intensity, low volume activities and untrained participants and engage in moderate progressions. You don't want to have a 50% jump in resistance loads from week to week. Keep it from 5 to 10% at the max. Now we want to get into uh, uh, disability specific uh, considerations. We're going to look at athletes uh, with spinal cord injury, athletes with amputations, athletes with cerebral palsy, and athletes with visual impairment. Now, when we look at athletes who use sports chairs, typically uh, these are athletes with spinal cord injuries, but they can also be athletes with amputations and athletes with uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, but these considerations are, are more geared towards the athletes who have spinal cord injuries and use wheelchairs uh, 
uh, for daily mobility. And some of the most common injuries are strains uh, and muscular injuries of the upper extremities. You've got your overuse injuries because you're using the shoulder joints for absolutely everything. Uh, fractures of the hands, falls, collisions, getting them caught between wheels. And again, the issue with overdevelopment of anterior muscles and weakness of posterior muscles that leads to shoulder imbalance. Another thing you need to be extremely uh, uh, aware of with athletes with spinal cord injury is autonomic dysreflexia. And if if you're engaging in programs with athletes with spinal cord injury, uh, I highly encourage you to do uh, further research outside of this session on autonomic dysreflexia because it, uh, as it says in red, it can be life-threatening. And there are a lot of different things that can trigger autonomic dysreflexia, and you see some of those triggers there, full bladder, constipation, full bowel, pain, infection, skin breakdown, ingrown toenail. Uh, these are all things that if you have full sensation, you're going to know. You're, you're going to realize that you're experiencing this condition, and you're going to do something to take care of it. But when you don't have sensation due to a uh, spinal cord injury, that you, you can't remedy the situation, and your body uh, your, your body still knows it's happening and it reacts to it and it starts producing different symptoms. And as you can see, some of the symptoms, high blood pressure, low heart rate, anxiety, uh, agitation, it, it can present itself as a severe pounding headache. Uh, you can be sweating for no reason at all. Some nasal stuffiness can occur. And one of the things to keep in mind, not everyone with a spinal cord injury is is uh, at risk for autonomic dysreflexia. Generally, it's people who have an injury level at T6 or higher. Okay, it has been found to occur in people with an injury level as low as T8, but T6 or higher is what you need to be concerned with. And uh, essentially, you know, the the big risk you're looking at here is cardiac arrest if you don't alleviate these symptoms. And the first thing, if, if, if you are dealing with an athlete that seems to have these symptoms, you don't want to sit back and try a diagnosis, uh, call 911. Just call 911 because, again, this can be life-threatening. But after you've called 911, uh, what you can do, sit the athlete up, dangle the legs, removal of the stimuli. Well, what's removal of the stimuli? Well, if we go back, uh, full bladder, constipation or bowel, uh, ingrown toenail, uh, sun temperature changes. If any of those are happening, remove that. Uh, catheterization, empty the bowel, or empty the bladder, rather. Empty the bowel, loosen tight clothes. Um, a lot of times uh, there could be a pressure sore on the foot. Take the shoes off. Those are, all, those are all things that you can do after you have called 911. And again, some of the complications, seizures, pulmonary edema, myocardial infarction, heart attack, or cerebral hemorrhage all life-threatening conditions, something you want to be very mindful of if you're dealing with athletes with spinal cord injuries. Athletes with amputations, um, obviously skin irritation and breakdown is an issue around the prosthetics. Um, need to make sure that the prosthetics are well fit and the appropriate padding and friction limiting material are being used. Uh, one of the things that's really of concern if you, get, if you have a new athlete who may not be uh, at a high level of fitness starting to engage in a strength and conditioning program, a sport, a physical activity program, they begin to lose weight, their prosthetics might not be fitting the same way, which means they're going to be loose, they're going to slide, and they're at higher risk for skin irritation and skin breakdown. And the other thing that you need to be concerned with is a failure of the prosthetic. Now here you see Oscar Pistorius running on two, uh, running on his two prosthetics, also known as the blade runner. What happens if one of those blades just snaps? on his downward uh, downward uh, push while well, he's going to end up falling flat on his face. Now, that just means that you need to make sure that you inspect your prosthetics on a daily basis, but it also means that you need to be ready to provide first aid. Uh, so if you have athletes with amputations in your program, uh, if you any type of physical activity program you're dealing with, you should be certified CPR and first aid. Athletes with disabilities, increases that need. Athletes with cerebral palsy, uh, very important to have a proper warm-up, cons consistent flexibility within the program to increase the range of motion. You need to make sure you're adapting your technique to the individuals, athletes with cerebral palsy. 
do tend to have uh, deficits in range of motion. They're going to have different gaits, uh, and you want to make sure that you're training around that. Seizures are relatively common in this population, so you do need to understand how to handle a seizure if that should arise. Um, because of the increased muscle activity, spasticity, you can have increased muscle, uh, increased muscle fatigue, and muscle fatigue can occur more quickly than it would in an athlete without CP. So again, something to be aware of because fatigue leads to injury. Um, again, do because of how cerebral palsy presents itself, the symptoms of cerebral palsy, uh, athletes with cerebral palsy whose wheelchairs have a higher incidence of upper extremity strain sprains and overuse. Uh, they also have more knee injuries because they can't utilize a perfect running gait. Um, and again, be aware of the role that spasticity plays. Um, and, and I really bring this up, and this, this comes up a lot in wheelchair basketball because we'll have an athlete uh, with cerebral palsy. They'll catch a pass perfectly three times out of five. Those other two times, the ball goes right through the hands, hits them in the face. And it's really easy to think, well, why weren't you focused on that? Why didn't you catch it? Well, it's a CP. It may have a spasm. You have to understand that the, all the different ways the spasticity uh, can affect athletic performance. And, of course, crashes. Um, are something that uh, can happen again due to increased incidence of muscle fatigue. You can see uh, a lot of times at the finish line, especially for some of the long races, athletes with cerebral palsy will just kind of hit that ground, and you need to be ready for that. Athletes with visual impairments, um, you know, obviously if you've got a visual impairment, you either have no visual cues or a decrease in visual cues, so you have to expend more energy through your other senses. Um, one of the things that you have to be concerned with as well is athletes with visual impairments who were born with visual impairments or never learned to run before they acquired their visual impairment may have different biomechanics. And that may be something of concern. It may not be, but you need to evaluate that and make sure that the, the biomechanics that they're utilizing for running aren't contraindicated that they're not doing something that's going to increase the incidence of overuse injury or increase injury potential. And again, uh, with the lack of sight, there is the possibility for crashes uh, with the VI population. Across the spectrum of disability, some of the things that need to be uh, considered, uh, we see here overuse injuries, dehydration, heat, illness, cold injury, acclimatization, seizures, pressure ulcers, uh, considerations with prosthetics, orthotics, MS, uh, brittle bones and concussions. We're going to touch on each of these here in a moment. Overuse chronic injuries, bursitis, tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, patellofemoral syndrome, sprains and strains, stress fractures, lower back injuries, all things that uh, everybody engaged in sport and, and physical activity uh, is susceptible to. And when you think about athletes with disabilities and some, some of the range of motion issues, some of the spasticity issues, um, the biomechanical issues that are a result of uh, the presence of the disability, these can all become uh, more prevalent. Dehydration is huge. If, uh, if you wait to drink water until you're thirsty, it's too late. You're already dehydrated. Um, and simple little chart. And I think we all know in this day and age, uh, we're all very concerned with hydration. I don't think the days of uh, being punished by not being able to drink. Hopefully those are all gone, but uh, it, it is serious. We need to make sure that athletes are and stay properly hydrated and want to make sure that you're drinking water before, during, and after event. Again, don't rely on thirst. If you wait till you're thirsty to drink, it's already too late. Um, it's better to drink some cool beverages. that will also help maintain, reg regulate your body temperature. Um, you want to begin fluid replacement immediately. And it's okay to drink sports beverages. Uh, and if you do, they, they have found the ideal carbohydrate concentration in those should be 4 to 8%. Um, if you're going to be engaged in physical activity for less than an hour, you really don't need to drink sport drinks. Uh, but if you're going to be, it's going to be 45 minutes plus 45 minutes to an hour, hour and a half or more, then you definitely do need to look at utilizing sports drinks. But what you don't want to do is confuse sports drinks with energy drinks. You should never, ever, ever, ever consume energy drinks prior to, during, after physical activity. Um, they are contraindicated. Uh, I can 
you know, every athlete who I've ever talked to who's done it has had issues with it, uh, from gastrointestinal issues to muscle cramping issues to uh, focus issues. Uh, there's just something about energy drinks which are not sports drinks. Sports drinks are not energy drinks. Uh, Gatorade, fine. Powerade, fine. Red Bull, no. Amped, no. Um, stay away from those energy drinks. Everyone's susceptible to heat illness, people with spinal cord injury even more so because they don't have the same thermal regulation uh, that people do. One of the first stages of heat illness, heat cramps, result of dehydration. One of the symptoms is you're going to be thirsty, uh, you're going to be fatigued, and transient muscle cramps, that means that the muscle cramps start moving all around. Uh, you know, a cramp is a cramp. A heat cramp, you're going to experience in a lot of different muscle groups because it's a whole body situation. Uh, treatment for heat cramps, adjust large amounts of fluid with a little bit of salt content, utilize some mild static stretching, and you can also use some ice massage in the affected area. Now we do have a National Athletic Trainers Association position statement on exertional heat illness on our website. Uh, I would highly encourage you to go uh, read through that. Uh, a lot of great information from that on that. Heat exhaustion, step up from, uh, from uh, heat cramps. Some of the symptoms of heat exhaustion, profuse sweating, cool, clammy skin, not hot, cool, clammy skin. A uh, person can be having chills, can be dizzy, lightheaded, can still be experiencing those muscle cramps. And if you have someone that's experiencing heat exhaustion, uh, nice representation there, nice picture, graphical representation of what you need to do. Uh, get those fluids replaced, use fans, ice towels, ice bags, get as much clothing off as you can to allow uh, thermal regulation, get to a shaded area or indoor and air conditioning if possible. Now, Heat illness, heat exhaustion can very quickly become heat stroke. And a lot of times, the only di way you can tell the difference is by taking the body temperature. And here, heat stroke, uh, there are some differences. The, the body temperature will be above 104 degrees. Uh, if you have the ability to measure temperature and it's above 104, call 911. That's immediate. As you, as you see, activate your emergency action plan. And uh, again, we have a great NADA position statement on emergency action plans on our website as well that links you to their uh, website. I would highly uh, suggest you read that. Um, one of the differences between heat exhaustion, heat stroke, instead of cool clammy skin, you're going to have hot dry skin. So now the skin starts to heat up and sweating has stopped uh, rather than dizzy lightheaded very disoriented, staggering, loss of consciousness could, could occur. Uh, heart rate could be all over the place, very high. Um, and again, this is an emergent situation. And even if you think someone might have heat exhaustion, still worth it to call 911. One of the things people don't realize, if you call 911 and the paramedics stabilize you, that's obvious you're not in a heat stroke situation. You're not going to get billed for an ambulance call unless they actually load you up and take you somewhere. So there should never be there should never be a thought of not calling 911. There should not it should it should never be a thought of finances in the first place. But um, unless the paramedics actually load you up and take you somewhere, you're not going to get billed anyway. So don't be afraid to call 911 because you don't want to make the wrong decision in, in, in that instance and cost someone their life because you're trying to save a few bucks. Along with heat illness, you can also have considerations with cold injury, and uh, we also have the NADA position statement on cold injury on our website that you can review. And there might be a few quiz questions uh, from those NADA position statements as well, so it would be a good idea to check those out. Um, relative to athletes with spinal cord injury, obviously uh, you have less sensation to the cold on the skin surface. Um, again, thermal regulation is not the same as it would be in someone without a spinal cord injury, so they don't have the same ability to stabilize that core temperature. They can't induce the shiver response, so the shiver response is something that our bodies use to keep us warm. So athletes with spinal cord injury are a little bit more susceptible uh, to cold injury, injuries from cold. And uh, some of the prevention strategies, closing uh, should provide an internal layer that allows evaporation of sweat with a minimal absorption. should have a middle layer that provides insulation and a removable external layer that is wind and water resistant and allows for evaporation of moisture. Um, you want to make sure that uh, 
uh, if you're going to be engaging in activity in a cold environment that uh, again proper hydration is key uh, also want to make sure that uh, there's the ability to eat food before during and after the activity want to have guidelines uh, in order to make participation participation decisions in other words when is it too cold to actually engage in the activity uh, we talked about what proper clothing should be and we also want to have rewarming opportunities and basically that's breaks within the activity to go somewhere warm back up stabilize then you can go back and, and do some skin checks and then you can go back and engage in the activity after uh, everyone's had a chance to hydrate eat warm up, check their skin, and then go back and enjoy the activity. When we talk about heat and cold related illness, one of the things that come up, comes up is acclimatization. Um, and even if you're not traveling, it may be necessary to acclimate due to local regional weather changes. Now, I live in Atlanta, and so we could have one nice spring day or a nice spring where temperatures are in the 60s, 70s, and then boom, one day all of a sudden it's 95 degrees and 100% humidity. Well, if, if I'm out and about and I'm used to running five miles a day uh, in 60, 70 degree weather, and all of a sudden the next day it's 95 degrees and 100% humidity, if I try to go out and run my same five miles at the same pace, I could be in a world of hurt. You know, I need to build my stamina back up. I need to acclimate to that new temperature, even though I haven't moved anywhere. Um, but uh, this can also, uh, this also comes into account for elite athletes who travel and compete. You need to make sure you give your body a chance to acclimate to the, inc the, the increased heat and humidity of different locations that you may be uh, active in. Uh, some of the different things you can do as the temperature and humidity rises or as you move to a new climate, uh, utilize morning practice times, gradually introduce afternoon, afternoon practice periods, and gradually increase intensity and higher temperatures and humidity. Now, we've got... Uh, you know, we've got one hot picture there, and we, the top picture shows a little bit more of a, a mountain snowy view. Interesting thing is that cold acclimatization, uh, it's difficult to achieve, and there's very little preventative effect. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do to really acclimate yourself to cold weather. So you really need to make sure that you're engaging those preventative techniques, making sure your clothing is proper, hydration, uh, nutrition, the food intake, and that's really about all you can do to acclimate yourself to cold weather, and you're really not acclimating yourself. You're just taking the proper come up precautions to be active in cold weather, but you can act properly acclimate yourself to higher temperatures and higher humidity in the combination of the two. You just want to make sure you do so gradually and do so safely. Again, seizures are uh, a concern in the, in the population of athletes with disabilities. Um, you need to make sure that you understand the range and types of seizures, and also when we talk about injury prevention, uh, and in this case, seizure prevention, understand what leads to a seizure. Uh, dehydration, stress, hypoglycemia, hyperventilation, electrolyte imbalance, head trauma. So make sure your athletes are properly dehydrated. Don't overstress them uh, with needless worries. Uh, make sure their nutrition is proper, they're eating the right types of foods, and their blood sugar levels are maintained properly. Um, uh, if they start to hyperventilate, make sure you utilize proper uh, response to that. Electrolyte imbalance, if they're sweating, a lot of sweating, make sure they are taking in those sports drinks, not energy drinks, sports drinks. And uh, do what you can to prevent head trauma. If a head trauma does occur, just remember that you're at a higher likelihood for that person to experience a seizure. Again, with prosthetics and orthotics, we just want to make sure proper fit and function uh, maintained properly. We want to make sure we don't have any skin issues for people that are using prosthetics and orthotics and that they are not, uh, they are not in a state of disrepair that could lead to an injury as well. Pressure ulcers, and these are some horrific pictures, and they're horrific pictures for a reason. If you are engaging in a physical activity program with athletes with spinal cord injuries, absolutely imperative that you, you promote weight shifts during that activity. And if, for those of you that aren't familiar with weight shift, someone who uses a wheelchair, they need to get some of that pressure off of their buttocks. Uh, at least once an hour, you want to do a one-minute weight shift every hour at minimum. Uh, you know, I would suggest, especially for people who are newly injured or younger athletes, get them used to doing a minute every half hour. Um, and uh, again, these are some of the injuries that can occur with prosthetics and orthotics as well. 
Um, and uh, not that, uh, not that uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is going to guarantee this never happens, but this is how bad it can get. And you want to make sure you're doing everything possible to prevent pressure ulcers and simply incorporating weight shift as part of your practice plan, part of your program plan is one way that you're going to get your participants into the habit of doing those weight shifts. And hopefully it'll be a lifelong habit and it'll prevent um, pressure ulcers as much as possible. Uh, MS, you know, it used to be assumed that sport had a negative impact on the course of MS because of a sensitivity to heat. Uh, an increase in body temperatures temperature of just one half degree Celsius can cause a slowing and or blocking of the nerve impulses conducted conduction in demyel <laughs> can't speak today in demyelinated fibers that may result in a temporary worsening of MS. You know, however, this idea is not supported by various studies. And uh, and those studies are referenced in the PowerPoint. So if you download the PowerPoint you can uh, look at that research. And nowadays the the main beneficial effects of exercise or stress. And recent studies show an improvement of fitness as psychological well-being of people with MS that are engaging in sport and uh, sport recreation and physical activity. But you do want to be con you do want to be concerned that you don't expose people with MS to uh, extreme conditions and heat or have them overexert themselves. Osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, it's a medical term for the disease commonly known as brittle bone disease. And OI is a genetic disorder in which an individual is born with fragile bones. And according to the OI Foundation, it will affect you throughout your entire life and lead to easy fractures. Now, osteoporosis is also classified as a brittle bone disease. And what's important to know is that low impact exercise can help improve overall health and maximize bone density in. Uh, OI and osteoporosis patients. And you should always consult your doctor before beginning an exercise program and you can find out more at the uh, Osteoporosis Imperfecta website. And again, uh, on the PowerPoint, there's a link in the notes section that you can, uh, um, you can uh, go to for more information. And this is, this is one of our blazers, uh, one of our blazer swimmers who's actually uh, competing for a spot at the Paralympic Games. Concussions is another uh, uh, another concern that we have throughout sport and across the uh, spectrum of disability. And a concussion is a traumatic brain injury. Um, and uh, in order to avoid concussions, first and foremost, make sure proper protective equipment is worn and make sure that, that all equipment, including the safety equipment as well as the sport equipment, is properly maintained and safe, has the proper uh, anti-tip bars, the frames are uh, the frames are solid. There's no cracks or, or, or breaks or compromises of the welds, so we can prevent concussions as much as possible. Now, if someone should experience a head injury, one of the things, if you don't have a medical professional there, again, you always need to err on the side of caution. If someone uh, hits their head, it's best to remove them from play, remove them uh, from participation, and have them evaluated by a physician. Uh, now, one of the things, if it's just, oh, it didn't seem like a little bump and you want to try to get a feel for it, you can utilize Maddox questions uh, and see what their responses are. And uh, as you can see there, the combined scientific validity with a quick and simple practical tool that can be administered by anyone on or off the field. Uh, and any incorrect response indicates uh, a concussion and requires removal from participation and evaluation by a medical professional. And those questions are, which field are we at? Who are we playing today? Uh, um, what what point of the game is it? How far is it into this half? Which side scored the last touchdown goal point? Uh, again, very simple questions. And if someone can't answer any one of those, that's an indication that a traumatic brain injury, i.e. a concussion, has occurred. They need to be removed from play. And before they come back to play, they need to be evaluated by a physician. There's a lot of great information at the CDC, and you can uh, click on this link, or you can just type it in cdc.gov forward slash, con slash concussion. Excellent, excellent, excellent information. A lot of free materials they will send to you that you can distribute to your program participants. So again, um, I'm going to summar summarize everything up here. We want to make sure we provide a safe environment, uh, appropriate, well-maintained equipment. We want to make sure that we 
that the training is individualized, specific to the person, making sure that they're enjoying the activity and they stay motivated. We want to be wary of warning signs of impending injury because we all know athletes want to compete. They're not going to tell you they're feeling, uh, feeling pain or an injury might be coming on. We have to help them with that. Proper warm-up, stretching, and cool-down, and stretching in both the warm-up in the form of dynamic stretching and stretching the cool down in the form of both dynamic and static stretching uh, will maximize athletic performance. The appropriate training prescription, the type of uh, training, the duration, the frequency, the intensity, and then the progression through that training. Pay attention to all those things and it's going to help you prevent as many injuries as possible. And of course, rest and recovery. That's something else athletes tend to have a hard time with rest and recovery because fatigue uh, is the friend of injury, and the chance of musculoskeletal injury increases significantly when fatigued. So make sure that you're paying attention to fatigue during a training session, and also athletes engage in proper rest and recovery between training and competition sessions. So at the end of this, use your common sense and logical thinking to prevent or reduce injuries. Take the information we provided, apply it to your programs and activities. Uh, getting back to the uh, physics lesson we went through, remember that force leads to motion, leads to energy, and that leads to energy, and that leads to injury potential. There's a limit of the body's uh, tissues, and once you exceed those biomechanical limitations, uh, injury can occur. Again, from the physics standpoint, remember that to limit or reduce force applied to the body, while also avoiding extreme deformation of body tissues in unnatural positions will help prevent injury. And chronic fatigue and overtraining is the enemy of the athlete with or without a disability. Athletes need proper rest and recovery, and with that, they will have the best chance to engage in physical activity, sport, and recreation injury-free. Some additional reading you might want to engage in. These are all great books. Um, and great resources for you to look further into some of the topics we touched upon. So I hope you enjoyed this session. This was Injury Prevention for Athletes with Disabilities, and good luck with your quiz.